Welcome, and thank you for, for being here. Um, I thought we'd start off by talking about the increasingly bizarre world of academia. I think to most people, I mean, it's, it's a huge concern, I think, to a lot of people, you know, parents of students, students themselves, including particularly Jewish students, of course. I think a lot of people look on in bafflement. You know, the academy should be the home of the free exchange of ideas. It should be the home of, uh, you know, academic of, of intellectual advancement. Uh, and instead, we're seeing it apparently increasingly in the grip of dogma, of, of ideologues um, and of bigotry. And of course, the world's oldest bigotry in particular. Um, but as a historian, uh, you have the blessing of being able to see the precedent and the causes and the trends that have led to this moment today. Um, could you explain to people what the hell's going on? Well, it's not easy. I'll have a I'll have a go, uh, Jake. First, it's great to be here and to be part of this this webinar. Uh, it's very important to me uh, that we have this discussion. About ten years ago, I began to become aware of a kind of disturbing tendency in the elite U U.S. universities. Uh, at that time, I was teaching at Harvard. I taught at Harvard in the history department and the business school uh, uh, for uh, 12 years. And uh, and most of that time, I, I really found it stimulating. And the students were terrific. My colleagues were terrific. It was an exciting time in my life. But then something began to change. Uh, and and it, was, it was around 2014 uh, when my, my wife, Ayan Hersey Ali, was first invited to commencement at Brandeis and then disinvited uh, in a kind of calculated humiliation. Uh, and this was our introduction to cancel culture, uh, which had already begun to affect conservatives uh, on various different campuses. Uh, but it was our chance to understand better what was going on. And what was intriguing to us was that there was this odd combination of radical leftists and Islamists who had sort of joined forces to accuse uh, my wife, Ayan Hirsi Ali, of Islamophobia and to uh, you know, publicly shame her by, by disinviting her. And I remember uh, when I started to encounter this same strange unholy alliance at Harvard itself, thinking how 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 odd these bedfellows are. What on earth is the radical left doing aligning itself with Islamist groups? And so we began to, to talk and, and write about this problem. And, uh, and, and indeed, I, I encountered it again when I moved to Stanford. We, we moved to Stanford partly for security reasons uh, in 2016. For security reasons? Yeah, because it, it was clear that, that uh, my wife and, and indeed our, our, our family were not safe in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We were too easy to find. And in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo massacre, we were strongly advised to relocate. So we did. We moved to California. But the same kind of phenomena were visible at, at Stanford, too. And uh, the more I delved into this, the more I began to realize that there was a fundamental and systemic problem in the elite American universities. And it manifested itself uh, in various places. Radical students were the obvious, a uh, kind of newsworthy place. Uh, but in fact, more important were the professors who saw themselves as political activists, and even more important, the administrators, diversity, equity, and inclusion officers, and Title IX officers. And there's a real army of these people in American universities now whose role it is, it's effectively to police speech. And it reached the point that uh, this strange combination of, of elements was creating an almost totalitarian atmosphere uh, on the university campus. The president of, of Stanford, who's since been forced to resign, told me that he received on average one email a day calling for some member of the Stanford community to be fired for something that they had said. And of course, the things that were being policed were allegations of, of racism, of, of bigotry against African Americans, or of homophobia, Islamophobia, of course. Uh, anti Semitism was almost never mentioned at that time. That, that somehow didn't rank there with the intersectionality 
uh, targets of, of preference. And I remember thinking that that in itself was a little odd. So to cut a very long story short, we've been saying for years there's something rotten at the heart of academia. Uh, the, the, the fundamental separation between scholarship and politics has broken down, that there are groups of people who see the university as a political vehicle. The events of 2020 made this even more visible. Black Lives Matter was a cause that university presidents felt the need to align themselves with. The Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, Claudine Gay, wrote a manifesto to the Faculty of Arts and Sciences saying that their role henceforth would be to combat racism, that that would be the purpose uh, of her leadership. Um, and and I, I, I'd like to urge anybody who's on uh, to mute, because otherwise we'll get the most hideous feedback, just as I'm reaching the climax of my story. <laughs> the, 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 the thing that happened after October the 7th this year was that the scales fell from the eyes of people who had not been listening, who had been saying to me, oh, Neil, you're exaggerating it. Universities are always rather liberal. It's just that you're conservative. Uh, and now those people who hadn't really been near the campus for 10, 20, 30 years realize what's been happening because it's now clear that there's a massive double standard that is applied at Harvard and it's applied at the other elite universities. Uh, the, the, it, the university reserves the right to police any speech that can be deemed offensive, even hurtful by some minority groups. But when it comes to attacks on Jews, when it comes to attacks by terrorists on Israeli civilians, then free speech suddenly is permitted on campus. Then the First Amendment suddenly applies and it's possible for student groups and others to chant support for Hamas, publish their support for the actions of Hamas, denounce Israel as if it's somehow responsible for these hideous ter terrorist atrocities. And what we saw last week when the president of Harvard, as well as the president of Penn and MIT testified was this double standard in action. Because those three people at no previous point in their careers had stood up for academic free speech, had said the first amendment applied on their campus, but suddenly it did apply because it was attacks on Jews that were under discussion. And I found that simultaneously revolting and affirming of all that I have believed and argued in the last 10 years. And you mentioned Claudine Gay, uh, who wrote uh, a manifesto in support of Black Lives Matter in 2020, promising to, to enact some uh, you know, deep-rooted change in university as a result was one of those who then was unable to be clear that calling for the genocide of Jews was a bad thing, yeah. only when it tips over into action, which presumably would be the, the, the act of genocide, that would be bad, but right. calling for it, we can live with it. Well, it's interesting what happened actually, because they, they clearly had been briefed by university lawyers who sort of explained to them, uh, perhaps they hadn't been aware of it before, what the position is in the United States with respect to free speech and what the First Amendment says is protected speech and what is not. And it's quite distinctive in the United States. And there's a clear body of law on this, which says that you can say all kinds of hateful things if you just say them. Uh, but there are there are thresholds that you can't cross and you can't cross into explicit threats, particularly if they're targeted at individuals and you can't cross over into harassment. Uh, and so all that they did in those hearings was to sort of parrot what they'd been briefed to say by the lawyers. But there were two problems. Problem number one, the First Amendment actually doesn't apply to a private university like Harvard, unless Harvard decides that it does apply. I remember being told by senior professors, we act as if the First Amendment applies here. I remember thinking, no, you don't. I hadn't noticed that, to be honest. <laughs> but, but the second problem was that for someone like Claudine Gay, suddenly to make a stand on the finer points of First Amendment law, when everything she had previously done was entirely at variance with that, was just massive hypocrisy. Uh, so it's not that she was saying things that were technically untrue about free speech in the United States. You can indeed say, uh, certainly on government property, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free. You can say that, you can chant it. Uh, that, that's protected speech. Uh, you can also presumably stand in public spaces and say dreadful things about other racial groups that you might wish to wipe from the map. This is protected speech. Free speech means people get the right to say obnoxious things. Just as in the 1930s, Nazis, pro-Nazi groups marched through the streets of New York 
chanting pro-Hitler slogans. That was protected speech then. But the thing is that this is a complete shift in the position of university leaders. There's been anything but free speech at Harvard in the last few years. In fact, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, run by my friend Greg Lukianoff, ranks universities in the US by the amount of freedom they allow. And in the most recent rankings for this year, Harvard came dead last. It was the, the, the worst university in America for free speech, yeah. according to FIRE's rankings. So the idea that this was the land of the First Amendment, that this was the way the campus was run, was just fanciful and fanciful. It's, it's, it's really, a, it, the, the only word for it is hypocrisy, isn't it? Yes. It's where a, a, a world in which microaggressions are a big problem, but actual macroaggressions can be overlooked. In fact, how Jacobson put it recently, he said that it seems like the massacre of Jews was not small enough to be a worry. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But let's let's move it on from, from there to think about, I mean, to, to try to answer this question, how can people who are so bright, um, so well-educated, the finest that Western society has to offer, be not, so, not just so stupid, but also so downright prejudiced and racist? Um, in terms of the precedent from history, yeah. this isn't the first time this has happened again. That's right. And I just published uh, in the free press Barry Weiss's excellent uh, online uh, periodical a piece pointing out that there was another time in history when the best universities in the world mm -hmm. uh, suddenly descended into anti-Semitism. And I, I was thinking of the German universities in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, if you go back to the 1920s, it's very striking that universities like Königsberg or Heidelberg or Marburg were the best universities in the world. Everybody acknowledged that. Uh, even at Oxford and Cambridge, people recognized that German scholarship was in a different league by that stage. So people would quite often go from Cambridge to do their PhDs uh, in Germany. And certainly from the United States, there was no question that when it came particularly to natural sciences, Germany led and Harvard and, and Yale and Princeton were distinctly in the second tier. And yes, if one looks at the history of the German universities in the 20s and the 30s, there's something very striking. And that is that they were early adopters of national socialism, that German academics, people with university degrees were more ready to embrace Nazism than say working class Germans. Uh, and this at a time when universities were a great deal more selective and, and elitist than, than they are today. And there's a really dismal history to be, to be studied. I remember studying it when I was writing a book called The War of the World that shows how this happened. There's a wonderful book about the University of Marburg, which describes how it was early to be anti-Semitic, early uh, for the students to seek to ban and ultimately to ban a Jewish student fraternity. This is in the 1920s. Uh, early to vote strongly for National Socialism uh, as early as 1924, big votes for the NSDAP. And so what can we learn from this? And that was the forerunner of the, of the Nazi party. The NSDAP was the official name of the, yeah. the National Socialist German Workers' Party. That's what it was always called. So what, what's the explanation here? I think there are two things. The first is that highly educated people uh, can be highly wrong. The idea of eugenics was regarded as cutting edge science around the world in the early 1920s. And it was one of many ideas that German academics uh, picked up and ran with. All kinds of so-called racial science flourished in the German universities uh, in the 1920s. Uh, in the early 1920s, German academics were publishing books with titles like uh, Life Not Worthy of Living, to justify the uh, euthanasia of the mentally ill. So that's part of the answer, that bad ideas, in fact, can be just as successful as good ideas uh, in, uh, in intellectual communities such as universities. But there's a second part of this story, which is, I think, worth bearing in mind. There's a kind of way you can instrumentalize ideology in the academy. At the time I'm talking about, German Jews, and, and these were not necessarily observant Jews, but people who were the Nazis defined as Jews. They might be married to Gentiles, they might have converted to Christianity, but in racial terms, they were Jews, played a very significant part in German academia. 
In fact, there were leading figures in nearly every discipline that you could mention uh, at that time. So for those who adopted Nazism, uh, this was a terrific career opportunity to get rid of rivals, often intellectually superior rivals, uh, as, as happened. Because very early on, after Hitler comes to power, a law is passed that essentially expels not only all Jewish civil servants uh, from employment, but all Jewish professors. Uh, because in the German case, professors were, in effect, civil servants. So this combination of toxic ideas that nevertheless had academic legitimacy and the career opportunity presented by the ideology explains the downfall of the German universities. Now, I think it would be almost impossible for the academic activist leftists who predominate at institutions like Harvard uh, or Yale or Princeton or Stanford today to recognize themselves in what I've just described to you. Because they would say, but wait, the dreadful German professors were right wing but we're left wing, which makes us morally superior. We would never engage in the kind of things that they engaged in. My response to that is, really? Are your universities so different? Let me tell you a story that I heard just a few days ago. Uh, the son of a good friend of mine, uh, who may even be watching, uh, uh, is currently a graduate student at an Ivy League uh, university. I won't say which one. Uh, and just a few days ago, he went to his assigned desk uh, in a university building uh, to his computer and under the keyboard was in capital letters a note that says Zionist Kike written in red and green letters and that is at one of the world's foremost universities now what is the difference between that and what was going on at St. Marburg or what was going on at Königsberg in the 1920s and 1930s I don't think there's a profound difference. The reality is that the radical left, as much as the radical right in the interwar period, has legitimized anti-Semitism. And while some people will say, oh, there's a distinction between our criticism of Israeli policy in Gaza and anti-Semitism, that distinction is lost on canvases. It is absolutely clear to me that the line is blurred and it's deliberately blurred by some groups with obviously malicious intent. Well, let's look a little bit into the, the, the roots of this weird convergence that you alluded to earlier of the hard left and Islamism. Uh, in one of the starting points, perhaps, uh, is in the 60s when um, uh, Palestin Palestinian militancy uh, was born out of the anti-colonialist movement. So it took a great, well, one of its prime examples was Algeria, where the French occupation for 120 years was, was brought to an end by a terror campaign which provoked a brutal French response, which saps public, public support for the French, and in the end they left this death by a thousand cuts approach. We can see that inspiring the Palestinian playbook, which was from the hard left originally, was then boosted by Islamism and radical uh, religion, which we see today. It's interesting, isn't it, that anti-colonialism is one point of similarity between that militancy and the hard left today. Can you just explore how the two schools of thought came together and are now almost indistinguishable in some ways? Well, it's helpful to go back in, in time. Let's go back 50 years to another surprise attack on Israel, uh, the Yom Kippur War, which almost exactly within a day, uh, uh, the, the, the event uh, that happened 50 years before October the 7th. Now, at that time, that the Palestinian cause was largely seen as a cause of the radical left. It was nationalism, but combined with Marxism, with the hope of Soviet support or support from countries in the Soviet bloc. And this playbook was being used all over the world at that time. Just about anybody who could present themselves as engaged in a liberation struggle against colonialism uh, had a shot at backing from Moscow. And if not Moscow, then Havana. Uh, so this was a very different world from the world that, that we know, because at that point, political Islam was a relatively dormant force. In 1973, if one looks through uh, the papers of uh, a figure like Henry Kissinger, he almost never talks about uh, Islam. Uh, only occasionally is it noticed that that's kind of part of, say, the Libyan regime that was established in, in the revolution in the late 1960s. It's only after the Iranian revolution of 1979, so six years later, 
that it becomes clear that there's this new ideological force in play, and that is, is radical political Islam, and that it's actually hostile to the Marxist-Leninists. They all get completely wiped out by uh, Khamenei's, Khamenei's regime in, in, in Tehran. So there's an interesting uh, tension at that time between those who want to pursue Sharia to establish either a Sunni or a Shia uh, political uh, theocracy, and those who are still hoping that the revolution will come with uh, support from Moscow. Well, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989-91, that kind of option fades and the Marxists become far less influential. I mean, they're still around, the radical leftists, but they're much less influential in the real world. Where do they go? Academia. That's where they can still assign Edward Said. That's where they can still teach about colonialism and the terrible uh, uh, crimes of, of Western empires and the heroic struggles of oppressed peoples. So they're there teaching their classes, assigning Edward Said's uh, Orientalism. Uh, and, and meanwhile, uh, the Islamists are working out how best to achieve their objectives. Uh, and their subtle infiltration of uh, university life, instead of revealing a contradiction between the old secular left and the new Islamists, actually produces the unholy alliance I, I mentioned before. Now, you might say, Surely queers for Palestine's a kind of absurd and contradictory position. And if you were uh, gay and you did go to Palestine, Hamas would not exactly welcome you with open arms. They might welcome you with open arms in order to throw you off a high building. But on campus, these contradictions seem not to count for anything. There's a complex ideology that has evolved on American campuses, which is a strange synthesis of the old left and the new left, uh, Islamism, multiculturalism. And its distinguishing characteristic is its ability to hold in some kind of relationship to one another quite different groups. As long as you can claim some kind of victimhood relative to white supremacy, relative to the colonial oppressive regime, relative to, of course, uh, phallocratic male uh, cisgender uh, hierarchy, then you're good. Uh, and so this is how the game is played. And, and there's a ranking. And if you're African-American transgender person, you're very near the top of the hierarchy. Uh, if you're a, a white uh, male, you're very near the bottom. The surprising thing is that not only are dead white males like me near the bottom, there are other groups that turn out to be near the bottom too. Uh, East Asians. Harvard's been discriminating against uh, Chinese and Chinese American candidates for years because they're really underrepresented relative to their test scores in the undergraduate body. That's kind of a surprise. And then Jews. And this is the point that, that really brings us, us together, that there is a kind of curious double standard where the history of the Jews, their fate as a minority that's been subjected to all kinds of oppression, not just by white empires but by other empires too that's somehow forgotten uh, and in a strange kind of way the ideology of intersectionality says our oh, jews are sort of not just white they're kind of super white and i think this is where the marxist piece comes in because what you notice is that the left has retained over more than a century a sense that capitalism and the jews are intertwined and who he who attacks finance capital also has to attack the jews and that, I think, is the key to what we see here. There's a kind of revival of some very old and toxic tropes that I remember first studying when I was writing the history of the Rothschilds more than 20 years ago. Mm. Fascinating. I've got to say, it's the first I've heard of the term phallocracy. Oh, uh, don't forget <laughs> that there are all kinds of fake new words that have to be learned. Yeah. And this is part of the way radical ideologies work, as Victor yeah. Klemperer pointed out in Dresden all those years ago. If you want to uh, impose your ideology on people, make up some weird words and force people yeah. to use yeah, them. Well, sense. with a strange ritual like, well, we didn't introduce ourselves with our preferred pronouns, did we, at the beginning of this? Well, shock horror. I mean, that's actually regarded as a terrible faux pas at some universities today. Shove it. Um, well, let's move on to the uh, to, to, to geopolitics. And one question I wanted to ask you as a as, as a you know one of the world's leading historians is 
about hope for the survival of the state of Israel. There's a, this idea that's around that a Jewish kingdom or a Jewish state has never survived more than about 80 years in the past uh, in, in that territory. Um, what signs of hope do you see now that will go beyond 80 years and maybe another 80 and another 80 uh, into the future? Well, I'm going to surprise you by being more optimistic than, than I think you expect. In many ways, the situation 50 years ago was, was worse in that there really wasn't any, any country in the neighborhood that was interested uh, in recognition uh, or indeed the survival of Israel. Whereas what's happened in the last two months has come after a prolonged period in which Israel's relationship with its Arab neighbors was clearly improving. We mustn't lose sight of what was achieved in, with the Abraham Accords and what may still be achieved between Israel and, and Saudi Arabia. I sense from conversations with uh, Saudi friends and uh, others in the region that the events of October 7th have only temporarily uh, derailed, maybe derailed is putting too strongly, uh, paused the rapprochement between uh, between Jerusalem and Riyadh. And I, I think we should recognize also that Iran has become, over the last 10 years, really significantly isolated relative uh, to the Arab uh, states, especially in the Gulf. And so I, I think strategically Israel's position is not as bad in the region as it was 50 years ago. And I think that, that may continue to improve. Uh, in, in the coming years, especially if uh, there's a change of government in Washington. Let's not forget that part of what happened on October the 7th was a consequence of the Biden administration's effort to revive the Iran nuclear deal, which took the pressure off Iran, allowed it more economic uh, breathing space. And with that breathing space, it was able to channel more resources to its proxies uh, in the region. Uh, if Donald Trump's reelected, uh, which is far from inconceivable, one consequence will undoubtedly be a return to the path of the Abraham Accords and a return to pressure on, on Iran. Israel's biggest problem, I think, is that globally, it has relatively few friends. Uh, and one can see this in voting patterns at the UN General Assembly. Uh, one can see this in the uh, outright hostility, not just of uh, Iran, but of, of other countries aligned with it. I also worry about the generational shift that we began by talking about. Young Americans, and it must be said young Britons, are a great deal more hostile to Israel and sympathetic to the Palestinians than was true even 10 or 12 years ago. And that's a shift that I think has to be partly due to what's been going on in universities. So I think Israel's international position is not especially good. Its relationship to younger generations in the English-speaking world is disturbing. But regionally, I think this position is actually better than it, it was 50 years ago. Uh, and so my hope is that as long as the United States remains committed to Israel's survival and its security, then another 80 years are something we can count on. Let me add one thing. In my view, it is a moral obligation for everyone in the Western world, regardless of whether they're Jewish or not, to ensure that there is never another Holocaust. And what we saw on October the 7th was like a trailer for a second Holocaust. It was as if to say, if we had the chance, this is what we would do to all Israelis, because what in practice from the river to the sea means is not just that Israel disappears from maps, it's that Israelis are killed en masse. Now, everybody in the Western world who knows anything about history knows that those people who would carry out a Holocaust are capable of anything. And my grandfather's fought uh, in two world wars. I grew up with a conscious, conscious sense that this was the worst thing that had ever happened, the Holocaust. And we have this moral imperative never to let it happen again. Young people need to understand that. I feel as if I've uh, made a mistake in not teaching for the last seven years, because it feels as if that message has, has somehow been overridden by the uh, anti-colonialist version of history. So I think we have to remind people of that powerful moral obligation to ensure that there never is another Holocaust. And we've been given a warning on October the 7th that there are people who would carry such a Holocaust out. Mm.
Sobering words. Well, thank you uh, very much. I'll try to get some questions up if I can. Oh, have you got them now? I've got a You've got them, brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, are you happy for me to read them out? Or yeah, well, let me have a look so I can, yeah. so I can get, the, okay. get the best ones. This is my chance um, to grab some yeah. water. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. there we go. Um, um, and if I can just say, if people do have questions, please uh, put them on the chat on the Q&A. Uh, and uh, Neil here is, will be, and, and Jake will be more than happy to answer any questions that anybody has. All right, there are, there are two questions here to, to get started with. Um, the first is about coverage of the Gaza conflict um, as compared to the coverage of the war against Islamic State and other wars. I mean, to me, this has been a, f uh, a fascinating and deeply disturbing thing to see because the campaign that we took part in alongside the Americans and the Iraqis and the Kurds against Islamic State was really no less brutal than the campaign in Gaza. I'm thinking particularly of the battle in Mosul of 2016-17 that killed between 11 and 40,000 civilians, began with a siege and an aerial campaign that a the brutal street fighting with against an enemy that was embedded amongst civilians. It's not all that different. But back then, not a single person came onto the streets. And we can see, and that's just one example, yeah. many other examples. What do you make of the uh, of the role of the media in all of this, in 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 creating ultimately the, the, the major movements of public opinion, which then translate into international political pressure, which have an implication in the real world for Israel's ability to defend itself? I, I find it concerning that major mainstream news outlets so quick shifted uh, from documenting and describing the atrocities of October the 7th to essentially presenting the Hamas case uh, that Israel was carrying out uh, war crimes or ethnic cleansing or even genocide against the civilian population of, of Gaza. And uh, I've discussed this with uh, some BBC journalists. I've said that at times uh, the Today programme on, on Radio 4 uh, seemed uh, to be quite distinctly skewed towards covering the Palestinian side uh, of the story. Uh, the same, of course, can be said of, of the New York Times and other outlets. I've stopped listening to national public radio in the United States because I find the bias so infuriating. And I don't think there's any justification for this. As you say, uh, Hamas has a conscious strategy of embedding itself in uh, densely populated uh, civilian settlements. That's a, now a familiar Islamist playbook. Uh, the network of tunnels is crucial to its uh, mode of operation. Uh, hospitals are clearly used uh, as nerve centers, as command centers. Uh, human shields are standard. Uh, in the way that these uh, organizations such as Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad operate. And one simply being duped uh, as a, a media outlet, as a journalist, if one is fed the story uh, that what we're seeing here are terrible acts of uh, inhumanity by the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, they can't win because if they get people moved out of the zone of conflict, that's ethnic cleansing. If they don't, then it's genocide. And that, that kind of coverage is inexcusable. And as you say, it's at odds with how other conflicts have been covered. You could maybe say that uh, Hamas's uh, PR people are better than Islamic State's PR people. Uh, but I think that's really uh, uh, a pretty good example that you just, you just gave. And I could go further. Uh, you know, many civilians, have been killed uh, in brutal urban warfare in Syria. Uh, and I don't remember demonstrations. Uh, including Palestinians. Including Palestinians. But I don't remember the demonstrations in the streets of, uh, of London or on the campuses of the United States uh, uh, on those occasions. So there is a double standard and it's indefensible. The only way you can possibly report on this campaign is that Israel has been confronted by an implacable and ruthless enemy that has carried out brutal uh, mur murder and kidnapping uh, and hostage taking 
And the idea that somehow Israel should do nothing, that it should simply shrug its shoulders and say, well, I guess we had it coming is totally preposterous. And, and there's no British government that ever existed that would respond that way to comparable attacks on British citizens. So I, I just find it bizarre. I mean, I, I, I can't really get my head around the way in which this, uh, this conflict is being, is being misrepresented. And it, I think, testifies to how successfully the proponents of this ideology that we've been discussing have taken their ideas from university campuses and implanted them in major news organizations. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it feels to me that when Britain, for example, uh, defends ourselves, whether it's against Nazi Germany or against Islamic State, it's a war. When Israel defends itself, it's a genocide. That seems to be the only difference. It's just a difference of labeling. And it doesn't strike uh, people who use this terminology as it should, as grimly ironic, that they should be using that term, genocide, uh, about a Jewish state. Uh, so I think we, we need to uh, ask the people who run news organizations to think very carefully about the coverage uh, that they're giving this conflict. There are notable exceptions. This is not a, an across the board story. And thankfully we still have a free press, which means that the other side of the story can be uh, told. But we haven't mentioned it. Social media is another particular area of concern. And in some ways it's more influential uh, than mainstream news organizations. I'm perturbed, to say the least, by the way that TikTok massively skews its coverage uh, away from uh, pro-Israel content to pro-Palestinian content. And this skew is just indefensible. Uh, and yet you can't help but wonder if it's quite deliberate uh, on the part of the Chinese owners of, of TikTok. So we, we're in a very new landscape in which uh, it's possible for a foreign power, the Chinese Communist Party, to exert considerable influence over the way that teenagers in the English speaking world think about an issue purely by making sure that the algorithm selects content that is pro-Palestinian and don't uh, grades content that's pro-Israel. Yeah, it feels like, like we, and particularly young people, are swimming in propaganda in a way that's utterly unprecedented in history. And we don't even see it because we're older and we can't, and we don't use TikTok, and we don't know what they're what they're looking at. I mean, my kids show me this stuff sometimes, and it was exemplified by that uh, viral viral spread of the letter to America yeah. by Osama bin Laden. There are videos of kids saying, "I never realised that Osama bin Laden had it right." Yes. I mean, what's going on? Yeah. Well, in fact, the, on leads me on to the second question, which you provided, James, which was, "What can we do about it?" There's been a, a sense, I think, that after October the seventh, it was like a flare going up and illuminating a battlefield you see where everybody is standing we see that few, fewer people are standing on our side than on the other side even people that we expected to be on this side are on that side it feels like um uh, a sort of uh, a mobilization in some way in a, in a broad sense like a fight what do you think people can do what 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 can what, what tools can we draw what attitudes can we have what how can we begin to try to push back against what feels like a wave of hatred. Well, I've been impressed by the way uh, in the United States, major donors to elite universities have uh, belatedly, but at last, said enough. Uh, I'm no longer going to support my alma mater if this is the way that it's run. And so that's an illustration of what can be done. Now, we're not all wealthy donors. Yeah. So if you're a donor, stop the donation. <laughs> but I just want to point out that many years ago, I, I gave a lecture at the Association of uh, alumni uh, and college trustees, uh, actor, uh, saying that there needed to be a taking pledge, uh, not just the giving pledge, but the taking pledge, and that donors, whether on a large scale or on a small scale, should have some due diligence in the process. And if they're giving money, maybe out of sentimental reasons, the place where they studied, but that place has become uh, a, a kind of activist institution committed to ideologies that they deplore, they should stop giving. Uh, and so that that taking of the money away is an important signal, uh, which should have been sent long ago, because I think if this had be, been started earlier, then we might not have got quite uh, this far down the road to perdition. What else can we do? Well, I think one of the, the great challenges uh, that characterizes our time is the difficulty of having civil discourse. Uh, this is a problem that I encountered just last week. Uh, I was in 
Texas uh, at an event at which my friend Barry Weiss was going to speak uh, at the University of Texas uh, at Austin, the great public university there. And uh, as Barry stood up uh, to begin her remarks, uh, a crowd of, uh, I presume, students, as I doubt they'd have got in otherwise, at the back of the auditorium stood up and began chanting uh, and shouting and later beating drums uh, in an attempt to disrupt the event. I'm glad to say this process didn't turn violent and eventually they were prevailed upon to leave the auditorium, though they continued uh, their demonstration outside. But this makes it difficult because the heckler's uh, veto is being used more and more. Mm -hmm. Events get disrupted, threats get made, uh, events get cancelled because organisers are afraid of that kind of uh, that kind of activity. And so the, the very business of saying, listen to me, I want to put the other side to you, has got harder. I've been very struck over the last 20 years by just how difficult it is to have a debate with the kind of people who stand up and chant. They're not interested in debate. They're not really interested in knowing that much about the issue. They clearly derive pleasure from their uh, uh, version of hooliganism. But to my mind, actually, football hooligans are preferable. I, I, I honestly prefer to hear the chants of football hooligans than to hear these equally mindless chants in support of the Palestinian cause. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll know, perhaps you saw some of the clips that when questioned, many young people have absolutely no idea of the meaning of the chants that they're uttering. Mm -hmm. which, which river, which sea? You'll get some funny answers yeah. uh, to those questions. So I think we have a problem. The old way of doing this was you have a debate, whether it was at a dinner table uh, or at the Oxford Union. And that has got much, much harder. Uh, though I don't think we should give up. I've been furiously writing, uh, as have others, trying to shape uh, this debate, doing uh, webinars, podcasts, television interviews, in the belief that we must never give up. We must never stop making these arguments. Uh, in fact, we can only redouble our efforts. Uh, and that's all we got. I mean, we don't really have... Uh, the option as journalists or academics or uh, investors to take up arms. We, we've got words uh, and we've got some financial leverage over the institutions that form opinion and we've just got to use those. Uh, it, seems, it seems to me that the most important thing for Jewish students and Jews on campus in general is not to be afraid and not to allow yourself to become um, to hide who you are, to, to hide your views, and to act meekly, because we know where that led us in the past. And it feels to me as if the only way things are going to be turned around is if the people who are being targeted just refuse to accept it yeah. and stand up. Well, when uh, my wife encountered cancel culture on the Brandeis campus, it was a little disturbing, given that Brandeis is historically a Jewish uh, institution with a large Jewish uh, student body. But I very well remember uh, one student, Daniel Mayle, who, who stood up uh, for free speech and stood up for my wife. And he was extremely courageous at that time, despite the fact that the left effectively sent him to Coventry. People wouldn't speak to him. Uh, he was intimidated and harassed. harassed uh, and, and yet he, he never, ever backed down. And I, I've often thought of Daniel uh, in, in recent times and of how we need more students like him who are prepared to face down the bullies and who are prepared to stand tall in the face uh, of intimidation. If universities were properly run, there would be better protection for students like Daniel. I thought at the time that Brandeis did almost nothing uh, to back him up and, and, and protect his uh, rights to free speech. Uh, but, but yeah, I think you need that kind of courage and uh, it's not easy. I mean, I, I put myself in the position of a student who lifts up the keyboard and finds an offensive and obviously personally targeted message like that. And I think, what, what is the right thing to do? Is it to pack up your bags and you know, head, head back to England? Or, or do you take your uh, grievance to a university that, uh, whose authorities seem strongly biased in the other direction? It's very difficult. I, I look back on my own time as a student uh, at, at Oxford and, and later as a young fellow in Cambridge, 
And I realized how lucky I was because in the early 1980s, there was pretty much complete free speech in British uh, university campuses. In fact, we could say quite outrageous things but with the complete impunity. It's tougher these days. And I, I feel for students who are on the wrong side of this kind of harassment. I really do. And I can only encourage them to stick together uh, and not fall silent and not be intimidated. Uh, there is a really powerful moral responsibility here. And uh, to look for support. There are organizations out there that didn't exist 10 years ago uh, that have been doing great work. And uh, I want to single out again the Foundation for uh, Individual Rights of Expression by Greg Lukianov. Uh, there's also the Academic Freedom Alliance. Here in the UK, there's the Free Speech Union. We've been very busy creating a network of institutions to uphold the most basic freedoms on university campuses. And so one should not feel alone uh, because there is no longer any reason to be isolated. There are organizations that are designed to give you voice, designed to give you protection, to make you aware of your rights. Uh, so don't just sit in your room in despair. Take action and look for the organizations that are there to support you. And that's a fact. I mean, I've, I often think of the um, of the chapter of history that uh, Hannah Arendt describes in uh, the second part of the banality of evil, where she goes through all the different countries in Europe and describes how they treated their Jews. And Denmark is the one that stands out because when Denmark was occupied, the Danish authority said, if anyone's going to wear a yellow star, put it on us first, resisted, refused to round up the Jews and deport them. And as a result, the interesting part was that as a result of that, that the Nazi overlords in Denmark also began to resist orders from Berlin. And when Berlin wanted to round them up, they had to send fresh troops in to do it. And so you can win the battle of ideas by pushing back and standing up. I'm not wanting to draw comparisons from between then and now, but it's an inspiring chapter in history well, that shows I'm what I'm prepared to make those, those comparisons. And I would also add that uh, if you look around uh, universities uh, today, it's worth asking, where is the rise of Hitler taught? Uh, where are the lessons of the Holocaust taught? Are there courses on the Holocaust? And if not, why not? I mean, that's a good question to ask because some of the great universities uh, have increasingly uh, diminished the significance of modern German history in their course offerings. Students, kids of 18, 19, 20, can't be expected to know, as it were, uh, from their high school education, what it was that brought Hitler to power and how that led that path led to Auschwitz. So I think it would be a very good question for everybody on this call to ask about the university they went to. Well, what exactly are you doing to educate today's students about those fundamental lessons of German history and of European history? Because the Holocaust is not just a German phenomenon. To me, it's shocking how little one, one sees of that kind of of course, uh, I can think of one university that, that decided not to replace its professor of modern German history uh, with another professor of modern German history, but instead to have uh, Native uh, American women's history in its place. I'm sure there's a role for Native American women's history, but it shouldn't be instead of the history of modern Germany. Mm. OK, well, we've got time probably for one more question. I'll see if I can see if there's one on the chat. Um, Let's have a look. Hang on. Here we are. Q&A. That looks like a likely place. Right. Um, so we've done that. Oh, so this is where you got them from, I see. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, OK. Well, why don't, we, why don't we go with this one? Do you think that wokeism, uh, and wokeism is a bit of a divisive word, but the problem is there isn't another word that you can use that's politer. So do you think wokeism is a form of West, Western self-destruction, that when rich societies become too complacent, they eat themselves from within. Well, for those who are wondering, who are wondering what wokeism is, it's worth explaining that it's a sort of shorthand uh, for all the different things that have been uh, lumped together uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, you know, there's the progressive left liberal politics that you might associate with Bernie Sanders, but that's really quite separate from radical uh, feminism and then radical trans rights, which is sometimes anti-feminist. And let's not forget critical race theory, which says that actually you should do racism, but only against white people. And then, and I, I could go on. And the trouble about uh, this whole uh, a, a agglomeration of ideas is that they are so inconsistent with one another that it's quite hard to describe them in any other way. 
other than through a word like wokeism. Woke is just one of these African-American terms that uh, progressive white people like to use. I got woke, in other words, I sort of red-pilled myself or whatever the color pillar is, and I suddenly realized that the world really was just white supremacy and, and all the rest of it. Bin Laden so, was right. Uh, and Bin Laden was right. Gee, I, I can't believe it. But nobody ever told me about him. So that that captures, I think, the, the at some level, silliness of much of this. Um, and yet it's, it's, it's absurd ideas that end up in a very toxic place. Uh, yes, it is self-destructive in answer to your question of Western civilization, and it's designed to be. The central target of wokeism is, in fact, Western civilization. You can trace its origins at Stanford to a campaign to get rid of courses in Western civilization because they were just apologetics for imperialism. So, yeah, it, it is absolutely a sign of the decadence of our civilization that such an ideology should be current. You know, the reason it's current is that young people just can't imagine what it is to live in an unfree society. Mm -hmm. They have so great difficulty imagining life in Iran, or for that matter, in Gaza, or for that matter, in North Korea, that they seem willing to create an unfree society of their own around them on university campuses. And this is a great failure of pedagogy. Because those of us who study, those of us who study totalitarianism should have done a better job of conveying to people how utterly terrible it is to be unfree, how horrific it is to live in a totalitarian regime where you have to fear the secret police, but you also have to fear your neighbors and even your own family, because anybody can inform on you. This huge failure of imagination is what makes workism possible. And in a way, there's a vacuum left by the absence of religion, perhaps, that wokeism has has flowed into. Um, and I think there's also a, a draining of authority away from figures like yourself and the replacement of that with TikTok. Well, I never wanted authority. It's why I became an academic. I, I just wanted uh, to study the past and try to communicate its, its lessons to as large an audience as possible, which was why I made a great many television films once upon a time. I do feel a strong sense of failure at the moment, if I'm honest. A lot of my uh, my work, particularly in the middle of my career, was was focused on learning the lessons of the 20th century. And I don't think I can have done a very good job given where we find our, ourselves. But yeah, I mean, I think it, it's it's never it's never time to give up. One always has to keep making these arguments and trying to, to get people to see what it is that distinguishes a free society from a, an unfree society. And also to convey to them that it's easy to lose your freedom. Uh, and, and actually, that's part of what happened in the mid 20th century, that the freedom was voluntarily given up. Germans voted to be unfree. They voted a dictator into power. And we have to learn those lessons again, it seems. Uh, and we have to learn them urgently. My great fear is that we've allowed things to slip so far uh, that when you look at polling of people uh, under the age of 25, they're quite prepared to embrace authoritarianism if you tell them that it'll deliver a solution to the problem of climate change. Mm. So there's a need to radically reform the way we educate people in high school as well as in university about what Americans call civics. And, and, and civics is about explaining what a free society is. And I think the only way you can really convey that is to convey also what an unfree society is. You like TikTok? Sure. Okay, how would you like to live uh, under Xi Jinping's and the Chinese Communist Party's rule? How would you like that? Uh, you're susceptible to Russian propaganda. Let's go and see what life is like in, in Russia. We're not very good at making young people imagine themselves, whether it's in Gaza or in Pyongyang. And we need to get better at that because right now, the agents of authoritarianism are making a great many gains in our public sphere. And the defenders of liberty are on the run. Wow. Chilling uh, note on which to finish, but also a call to action. So thank Absolutely. you so much, Neil. Never give up, as Lord Reith, the founder of the BBC, used to say, never give up. Absolutely.